Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Christy Amobi and I work in the product division of Xtral. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you today to our webcast. Um, for more than 10 years, SARP has supported countless investigators and complex radiation research initiatives. And one of the things that SARP is known for is its ability to support researchers with little to no knowledge of treatment planning to easily configure sophisticated radiation delivery. This is definitely something that we hear from uh, researchers all the time about um, SARP's value. Um, although SARP includes a native treatment planning system called MuriPlan, Xtral is committed to supporting all of our clients in using the treatment planning system of their choice. So we are delighted that we have a partnership with a team at Smart Scientific Solutions to support smart treatment planning on SARP. And today we're welcoming the SMART team, Dr. Patrick Granton, Dr. Stefan Verhoof, and Dr. Frank Verhagen from Smart Scientific Solutions to showcase the SMART XPS system, the newest addition to the Xtral treatment planning portfolio. SMART XPS now supports the advanced 4D uh, treatment delivery system, as well as the integrated M MVC, which is only available on SARP. And uh, with that, I will go ahead and now turn it over to Dr. Granton. Hi, um, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. Thank you for joining me on this uh, short presentation on our treatment planning system, SMART XPS, which stands for Xtral Planning System on SARP. Uh, this is uh, part of the Xtral webinar series, and uh, this is brought to you by SMART Scientific Solutions. So who are we? Uh, we are um, a number of people nowadays. Uh, we were a bunch of earlier adopters who uh, began in Maastricht, the Netherlands, at a master clinic and now have expanded to include uh, some other employees, uh, namely um, Randy Jagger, Nick Stout, and Paula Bartelt. Uh, the founders are myself, Patrick Granton, along with Frank Verhagen and Stephen Manhoof. So it's a little bit who we are. Now you know who we are, uh, a bit of our history. We started uh, almost 10 years ago this year um, with our initial uh, treatment planning system for small animals, uh, Smart Plan, uh, that was on the uh, uh, DXI system. Um, and we've evolved ever since then and been working and developing on this, um, on treatment planning systems for small animals for some time now. In 2018, we released uh, Smart ATP. And more recently, we've now released Smart XPS, uh, dedicated for the extra planning um uh platform sarp so prior to the small animal systems uh, many institutions were irradiating preclinical animals in rather crude uh non conformal ways here i'm showing you an example of four mice being um, aligned with uh, flying tumors uh, irradiated in the linux uh, over here, you also see what I used to call the X-ray oven, where animals would just get placed in and non allocation radiation be uh, applied to the whole animal. Now, uh, it's not saying that these experiments are no longer valid. It's that the requirements for high precision conformal radiation has uh, been more um, uh, more more necessary in these current times when we're doing highly conformal radiation with patients. One of the reasons why these type of uh, previous radiations are simply just less effective and less specific is that, uh, for instance, uh, if we're looking at typical uh, clinical megavolt energies, um, a number of the, a lot of the doses uh, passes through the animal before it even uh, reaches its uh, uh, equilibrium or buildup. Uh, and that has effects not only on the upstream effects, but also on the downstream effects, where um, uh, you have a significant drop offs where you have changes in medium. And uh, at these higher energies, uh, including that you have a number of scatter, which makes for a less uh, conformal sharp beam, and it is not ideal for conformal small animal radiation. 
so effectively the energy and uh, needs needed to be scaled down to a different type of platform which is why these uh, small animal radiators uh, became uh, on the market um, another addition to um, uh, difficulties in translating preclinical uh, radiation studies into clinical um, uh, phase one studies or uh, subsequent more deeper studies is that um, unlike in traditional clinics where if you run a trial you have to register your trial and all your methods beforehand uh, preclinical animal studies uh, suffered at least in reporting wise of the methods uh, that would be required for uh, repeatability so as you can see here that a number of um, this is a uh, publication that comes from um, uh, 2020 actually so a recent publication about uh, 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 a, a summary a peer review of over 1700 papers where they tried to extract if these papers could report accurately the source model and energy and described uh, the, the, the protocol, the geometry, equipment, and medium. This is for uh, what type of dosimetry they performed and uh, if they indicated the, the, the dose they uh, applied, dose rate, fraction schema, and uh, it, over here on the right, whether or not they gave some indication of the geometries they were using. So as you can see, most people uh, indicated the protocol and uh, uh, the amount of dose they gave, but few gave details about the underlying um, uh, dosimetry required to uh, accurately determine uh, dose in animals. Um, and another paper has highlighted, uh, some see this actually has a relatively positive effect actually that um, in a, a number of 76 Animal trials shows that the uh, methodology did not meet that of the clinical study, and that only 37% um, 30 of studies were actually replicated in human randomized trials. Now, this might seem a little low, uh, but actually, it is relatively high uh, if you look at the whole field of uh, pre-critical uh, science. Um, but it uh, bears to be said that there is some room there um, to create uh, more. Um, studies that align with uh, the necessary reporting requirements uh, in order to uh, um, uh, encourage and uh, 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 more um, randomized trials in patients. So my point is that uh, previous animal small animal radiation studies were conducted um, with uh, they could be improved let's say that and that um, what we hope to show you is that in this presentation uh, smart xps will hopefully allow you to uh, more accurately report your small animal studies uh, so that they uh, can be rep replicated at other institutions and therefore increase the likelihood that they can be translated to human trials um so uh in addition to the dosimetry that was required uh, to be able to irradiate animals properly, there was at the same time new animal tuber models that were coming on the market. Uh, these include orthotopic or xenographic, where you basically want to uh, replicate the disease at the site of the uh, original um, organ. And in order to do that, uh, you have to include novel small animal imaging because this means that these um, uh, diseases are now uh, in titer in the animal and requires some amount of targeting through uh, imaging methods to accurately treat the uh, disease site. Yeah, it is believed that with through these orthotoc models, you will better replicate um, the uh, clinical scenario uh, with having the proper tumor microenvironment. Here's an example um, of two different imaging methods you can apply to try to target these sites, either through 2D X-ray imaging panels uh, or through um, more new bioluminescent optical technology, 
which is provided on the Spark platform. Um, there's been, in Europe, there's been an Astro working group that has been initiated on the technology for small animal, pre pre small animal radiotherapy research in 2015, um, with a mandate set to uh, investigate the state of the art of animal uh, radiations technology, issue recommendations on how to use technology, and issue recommendations on the development of technology. Because this is a relatively new field still, it was more um, information based uh, uh, seeking uh, committee, and it resulted in um, uh, this uh, ACROP guideline paper uh, headed by Frank Verhagen. And in that paper, they list a number of suggested uh, requirements for performing accurate small animal studies. And I encourage you to view table two of that article where it lists a number of things such as um, what kind of setup, what kind of treatment fields and margins uh, you might want to include in your own study. So why is a preclinical TPS important? Um, I've explained to you now that uh, we need different energies to use. Um, we need KV instead of MV. And as soon as you downscale to KV, you also, uh, in addition, need to know more information about the tissue requirements because they play an effect on the dosimetry. In addition, um, we're going from small to very, very small beams. Um, typically, uh, uh, the smallest beams you'll see in the clinic may be in the order of, um, you know, one to two centimeters, while in a mouse, we're looking at anywhere from between one to five millimeters, potentially. Um, this downscaling also requires more stringent uh, requirements on the imaging techniques that include very high resolution uh, imaging techniques and very small voxels. And uh, in addition, um, you need a TPS that is uh, um, a real-time treatment planning in that you can both image, plan, and treat all in the same while. Um, a number of clinics are trying to do this for patients, and we've been doing it now for some time for small animals. In addition, that a preclinical TPS uh, TPS is, is important is that, like I said, it improves data communication and these reporting issues. So all of the um, data that is generated within Smart XPS can be exported and stored and um, collated. So this will help you, hopefully, in uh, uh, making sure that you can accurately report uh, what occurred. Um, this is a screenshot of showing uh, of Smart XPS, showing that all the uh, relevant data is exportable. We'll go through it later in a, a, a short demo. Um, but things as 3D dose structures, plan data on our own column fire formats, as, as such as DICOM standard, can be exported and run in external programs if you so be it choose. So another thing that the preclinical tree yes, uh, improves is that um, it overcomes the complex dosimetry methods such as TG61 uh, and allows biologists more uh, more freedom to conduct their own experiments with without the help of a, a physicist on hand. Here's an example of a paper written by Carol Noblet who explained um, that uh, uh, if you don't accurately include the, the backscatter factor through um, the standard dosimetry protocols such as TG61, then you can be um, inaccurate to up to 15% of some of your um, uh, hand calculations. So uh, the small renal 3PS uh, alleviates this concern and because it doesn't uh, doesn't it, it runs the calculation itself. It's a 3D calculation model, and it no, it no longer requires a user to input these sort of backscatter factors that would maybe require. So. Um, basically, that just highlights what I just said, is that it's a high-resolution 3D uh, dosimetry method using Monte Carlo techniques. In addition, um, um, small beams require somewhat extra attention uh, in that uh, 
they uh, can um, undergo what's called uh, occluded source. So uh, the profiles for small, very small beams uh, begin to look a little bit like a pinhole, and um, that is uh, difficult to um, replicate or to uh, um, be able to determine within an animal unless you uh, make use of these um, uh, methods such as Monte Carlo to include uh, the, uh, the profile of the source and in smart XP, XPS we, we do include that and we commission the machine uh, to be able to report um, beams um, as small as uh, one millimeter. It's an example of a commissioning uh, PDF report that we will, can provide to you upon um, a successful commissioning of the TPS. Here you can see a number of the fields at different depths and how they match with our planning system and that which is methered using uh, 2D film dosimetry. So why is the preclinical TPS important? As I mentioned, uh, we use Monte Carlo-based techniques, and they also overcome some dosimetric uncertainties in inhomogeneous media, such as long bone, um, et cetera. As I mentioned, that uh, changes in uh, uh, different uh, media uh, require um, uh, a better understanding of the media itself to be able to determine what dose is there. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, a question. Um, there are two different ways to report dose to medium, dose to water, and um, uh, the, our platform allows you to choose which, me, which, which method you choose to report. Uh, standard is uh, dose to water, um, and, but uh, for um, uh, materials such as bones, um, depending on which uh, uh, option you choose, you can report them in a different way. It is a relatively, it could be used for some scientific, under some scientific investigation about what is the better uh, factor to report. Uh, it, in the end, it will just become down to a scale factor between the two. But uh, we allow you in XPS to um, basically explore these type of um, uh, radiation dosimetry questions or, or not to um, by simply providing you with the default uh, settings which are sufficient enough to conduct any experiment you like to. So, um, again, with the PPS, it also allows you to uh, accurate targeting of sub-structures sub, sub, sub or functional imaging, such as BLI or PET. So, uh, Smart XPS allows you to uh, read in different imaging modalities, such as uh, the BLI or PET, and you can, try, tr you can target on those techniques. Um, here's an example of uh, a mouse in a BLI uh, scenario where you can see the tumor on the flank. Here you see um, the BLI tumor um, uh, highlighted uh, as a source of uh, the, uh, the target. And in, through a treatment planning system, you can uh, design fields to target only the uh, disease site of interest. Here's an example of a study that we conducted some time ago involving uh, lung fibrosis. And in the study, we were interested to know um, if a, a drug uh, became um, a radio protector or not. And what you can see is under uh, an animal undergoing uh, 39 weeks of imaging, uh, the animal on the left receiving zero gray, and the animal on the right using 20 gray of a highly collimated beam uh, targeted only to a portion of the lung. As you can see, for example, here, you have somewhat fibrotic tissue in the lung in the end, while the other lung has been spared. So this allows you to explore different biological questions and, um, and allows you to, for example, um, have a control uh, so uh, in within your own animal so you can target one lung and not the other lung to see 
how they compare. Also, you may be uh, interested in uh, doing specific uh, organ um, targeting studies, such as um, spine column irradiation or um, whole or half long irradiation using different size uh, variable apertures. And uh, or um, this is an example of another study we performed using in an orthotopic, the bestoic model. Uh, brain cancer, where we injected contrast, and um, although it's difficult to see, we were able to delineate the tumor inside the uh, brain of uh, the mice and uh, target uh, only the uh, disease. So I haven't mentioned it yet, but you know, some of the reason why it's important to um, have these sort of targeting and conformal radiation studies is that it allows you to focus on the disease site itself and not on um, um, any toxicities that result from uh, the uh, action of uh, applying radiation, which may distract from your primary end endpoint question. Um, in this particular study, we were using a number of drugs uh, in addition to radiation. And uh, you want to be able to determine with high precision what effect radiation has on uh, disease and not what effect radiation has on uh, on normal tissue. And therefore, it's important to make sure that you uh, target these disease sites locally uh, so that they don't affect what your underlying endpoint is. Um, and in particular, you are tr treating these at, at, at um, dose levels that you're looking for um, a difference, not necessarily looking for a cure, but looking to see an improvement. Uh, so it is very important to make sure that you uh, eliminate um, uh, spiraneous toxicities in animals and focus on the disease model itself. Yeah, in the end, what do we want to do with these platforms is um, sort of a, a whole life cycle of um, injecting, targeting, treating, analyzing, and applying into humans if they can translate. And then again, uh, going back into the clinic, sort of a, a cycle of um, optimizations. So, um, and, and, and animal studies allow you to make these sort of uh, optimization procedures um, and, and fine tuning uh, your study in order to create um, something uh, that may be promising for, for the clinic and, and for translation. So now I've talked about the importance of why is a treatment planning system for preclinical animal studies important. Uh, now I'd like to show you a little bit about how the smart XPS system looks like, um, how it behaves, and how you can be apply it to your own clinic. This is our splash page when you open the program. This is the uh, initial setup page of the program. Here we are choosing. Uh, a folder to load in um, images that are acquired via the SARP. As you can see up top, um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, seven taps essentially, and the workflow goes from um, beginning to end, so from left to right. Here now we have some information about what images are available. It tells you a little bit about when they are acquired and um, what type of images they are. You can, in addition, have a secondary image. Um, and why would that be important is in fractionation studies, you may want to align your animal uh, into the same position as they were for the uh, previous fraction. We allow you to do that through XPS. Okay, so this is the import stage where you can choose your data. Now, following the import stage, when you decide what data you want to use or, um, or that was just acquired from the sort platform, um, you need to assign your tissue media um, and um, it's relatively simple to do. Um, 
uh, it could be performed by a biologist if you have the default set up correctly. Um, here we have a three tissue scheme. Uh, you can set the preferences to however you like, and they remain saved. And when someone comes the next time to do it, they will not make the need to make these adjustments. It will already be uh, set up as your normal preferences. But now we're just showing you a little bit about what's, what's capable within the, um, the platform in, the, in order to uh, um, identify your tick shoes. What you're seeing here in the bottom left is a, a basically a CT to density curve where you have CT, dense, uh, CT numbers on the bottom and densities on the uh, y-axis. You can drag and drop these uh, uh, thresholds using the mouse and uh, basically uh, uh, select tissue and, for example, long um, uh, for your animal. But once these are established, it's not something you usually have to tweak anymore. Once you have your tissues uh, selected, then we move on to um, the contouring stage. What this stage allows you to do is basically uh, generate data for uh, how your animal was uh, treated through uh, dose volume histograms. Now this step uh, is relatively quick within um, XPS. Uh, if you uh, um, we have a number of tools uh available to create fast contours what you're seeing now is um, basically a region growing technique where you plant a seed and that grows until uh, a point where you're satisfied it's encompassed the organ of interest in this case the lungs so as you can see in a matter of seconds we've already generated contours for the lungs And you can go on and other organs of interest, such as a GTV. Here we have four techniques, freehand, brush, region growing, and interpolate. So what we're doing here is just through a number of slides, uh, selecting a potential tumor and uh, when you're satisfied that uh, it's encompassed the tumor you can just extrapolate uh, interpolate excuse me uh, and then you have the 3d target <clears throat> if you so choose you can also change the uh, medium of that specific target Here we also offer, in addition, other methods to create the, for example, margins, such as a PTV, just like you do in the clinic. And other Boolean techniques to um, for example, uh, have lungs minus GTV uh, or PTV in this case. So you're only basically looking at the healthy lung structure and the disease structure. There's one other technique we didn't show you, but um, based on your earlier segmentation of tissues in the contouring uh, CT to density, CT to MD bottom shell, you can uh, essentially generate contours from those material edges. Now, <clears throat> once you've uh, created contours for uh, your animal, you move on to the um, fourth uh, tab, which is what we call planning tab. Here you basically place the target on uh, your region of interest and choose the type of 
technique you'd like to perform. Here we're switching between two different uh, beams. We offer the mode to have static beams or dynamic beams. As you can see, this green one now is a dynamic beam, which will begin and end from this location to that location, or about 15 degrees. Now we are showing you um, rotations of the couch. So this allows basically non-conformal -conform beams uh, according to whatever your couch rotation is, which is uh, certainly available in SARP and important within SARP to perform those type of studies. And now we're finally showing you the option to include a variant collimator. This gives you a freedom to choose the size and dimension as you like. This demo is essentially done to show you a little bit about what's available and not necessarily how you use the system for an animal treatment. You would obviously uh, speed past a lot of these steps and go directly to what you have already determined your protocol to be. Finally, when you've um, set up your desired treatment plan, you run the calculation. Here again, we are showing additional options which are included for uh, Monte Carlo nerds if they like to investigate these type of um, parameters. Although uh, the default setting would be sufficient for standard biological studies. <clears throat> when your user gets a little more familiar with how the platform works, there are some options to uh, speed up this uh, dose calculation where uh, you can um, reduce the number of potential uh, histories per square millimeter and uh, increase the voxel size of the underlying uh, dosimetry. Um, once you've established a, a technique that fits with your study protocol and your time constraints, then these are again parameters that you will no longer need to choose while you are performing your study. Here we're showing the calculation running. This is only on a local laptop, so not uh, the computer which will be provided to you for SARP. Um, so uh, although it's not slow, it's just uh, not as threaded as uh, it's possible on a SARP computer. From there, that's done. Basically, the dose question ran, and now it's importing the dose imagery data. Now the dose has been loaded into the Smart XPS. And you can remove the uh, beams uh, visualizations from the uh, screen and see only the dosimetric data, which on the left uh, is indicated in types of gray. Okay, moving on. Finally, when you've um, ran your calculation, the dose has been imported. Uh, we offer you a number of techniques to evaluate uh, if it's a good plan or if the ten plan needs to be tweaked. Here we're showing you a differential dose uh, volume histogram and the standard uh, integral dose volume histogram. can adjust the dose level, viewing level. You can display it differently. You 
you can have isodose only contours so you see exactly uh, what is being truly rated within the animal. So the platform provides you a number of flexibility to visualize uh, the symmetry within animals, to calculate the, the symmetry within specific parts of the animals through these dose following histograms and dose following metrics. Um, and uh, I'm sure you will come to some sort of standard um, user settings that you find ideal for what you need to achieve. Okay, and finally, when you're finished with your study and you say, okay, great, and now I want to store this uh, and move on, you can um, select all the data that has generated in the session and um, export all the data that's, uh, that, that was created and, uh, and you can use that for in, in, importing on other platforms such as, for example, MIM or um, any of the die computers such as uh, Osarius or a 3D Slicer. These are all available. And finally, um, if you're satisfied with the treatment planning um, uh, uh, for your particular animal, you will obviously update the status of um, uh, the, the plan and that will be sent to SARP and uh, be able to be delivered directly from their platform. Okay, so this is sort of a current up-to-date version of uh, how the platform exists today. Of course, we are always um, undergoing developments and improvements to the platform. And I just thought I'd give you an indication of where we're headed in that in that direction. And we're looking at another um, advanced artificial intelligence methods to uh, auto-segment animal organs uh, more intelligently and, and faster. So that's something that should be, um, it needs to be validated, but it seems to be working very well. Now we're looking for doing uh, inverse planning methods. So um, instead of doing a, a forward-based planning method, as you've seen now, but creating um, a, an inverse planning method saying, this is what I want to treat, even that uh, that best matches the uh, target and uh, uh, the beam arrangement that, that, that provides the best uh, um, symmetry for that target, uh, we've worked previously with uh, um, the Technical University in Delft and developed um, these inverse planning methods, but have yet to implement them yet in the XPS planning system. And moreover, um, we we're thinking about including margin recipes. Um, we'd like to further integrate uh, BLI and deep learning techniques. Um, and yeah, those are on our, basically our, our, our and priority list for improving the system as it is currently. If you'd like more information about our company or who we are or contact us directly, you can simply go to our website at smartsafesolutions.com and I'm uh, free to take your question now if you have any. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Granton. Um, I would like to just remind everyone that if you have any questions, you can ask them through the questions function of the GoToWebinar control panel. So the first question is, uh, how much training is required? Yeah, so uh, the idea behind the software is really that it's uh, easy uh, uh, to use, which uh, hopefully you've already just uh, seen that and the way that we usually uh, do training is that uh, we start off initially with a more elaborate training session in which we also explain some uh, the background information 
uh, behind the different steps, uh, which usually takes like uh, one to two hours or, or something like that. And then um, people who use the software are usually not experts yet in uh, the radiation planning per se, like a biologist or, or uh, 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 so then you really have to start from uh, the beginning. And we usually do like three to five uh, guided sessions with them. And then they're uh, comfortable to, uh, to do basic planning on their own. So in total, you will be looking at, uh, at like three to five hours, maybe. OK, thank you. Um, I, I think related to that question, um... You, you kind of touched on this, but it, it's somewhat related. Uh, how much background is required in Monte Carlo simulations um, to sort of get up and up and going here? Very good question too. Um, I would say nothing. Like uh, uh, the Monte Carlo uh, Doge engine uh, behind it is, is pretty much uh, completely hidden from uh, the end users, so they only have to interact with smart xps and it does everything at a for them basically only if they if they really want to uh, explore a specific monte carlo parameters then uh, then they are able to actually do that as uh, patrick um, showed okay okay Next question, um, what are the initial data required by the TPS in order to perform the calculations? Um, and related to that, what data need to be measured? Uh, it's also, of course, a very uh, important step in uh, getting the software up, uh, up and running. So basically to install uh, the software itself is really uh, simple, of course. We, uh, we just install it on a, a powerful computer. But then, of course, it needs to uh, be able to, uh, to spit out the radiation pl uh, uh, plans for a, a specific irradiator. So what we always do is, is that we really uh, measure the, um, uh, all the individual beams and also the, uh, the variable collimator. Uh, we're usually uh, using uh, the radiochromic film measurements for that, as that really uh, offers the uh, uh, high spatial uh, 2D resolution that we need for these uh, machines. Um, uh, so we use that uh, to really investigate uh, specific beams, uh, the average output, uh, the number of sizes, uh, depth dose, um, uh, in combination with that, we also do uh, uh, the CT imaging calibration, basically. Um, and we measure all that. It's a lot of measurements. Uh, we process that. Uh, we we produce a, a final report of that with a uh, elaborate overview, basically, of everything that we had measured. And then uh, we use what comes out of it to, uh, uh, to set the software up for that specific machine. Uh, so it's really something that that, uh, that should be uh, a specific for uh, a machine. Um, and that's more work, of course. So in total, I think it's a day or two yeah. of measurements and then uh, some processing time. and. Uh, um... Okay. Yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. Our next question Does the customer need to create their own HU calibration curve? Usually that's incorporated in the uh, commissioning procedure. Um, it's something that we're still uh, looking into uh, as well. Uh, but so we set up initially for uh, the imaging spectra that they want to use uh, and that can be extended later on through the settings of uh, smart xps okay 
Another follow-up question about the commissioning. Um, how how detailed of a commissioning do you expect for the software? I mean, Patrick, you um, highlighted a little bit about that, but the follow-up question is, is it always done by um, by the team, the Smart XPS team, or um, can it be farmed out to a hospital radiation oncology department? Um, typically, is what's happened in the past is that the uh, installation team, um, be it the um, uh, XREL or um, uh, the service provider, uh, acquires the measurements, and we do the processing. Um, that would be a standard uh, method of working. Um, uh, uh, it can be that we are on site uh, at the same time, um, depending on where it is located. And okay. access to the site. Okay, um, next question. Can Smart XPS be configured to integrate open field in vivo and in vitro irradiation planning? Um, in principle, it should be already uh, configured so you could do that um, if you're interested. I mean, if you just treat the, uh, if it's a petri dish you're treating in. It's treated as if it was a mice, and then you um, acquire your images and follow the same procedure. Um, it's a, it is essentially the same. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, uh, Stefan. Yeah, um, yeah, indeed. The in the future, like uh, at the petri dishes or uh, the well plates, we have uh, we've definitely done that in the past and and that's indeed as uh, Patrick says it's it's like if, um, it's kind of uh, ready for that so as long as, as as what you want to irradiate in the end uh, fits in the field of view of the CT scan um, you import the scan and then you ha just have to make sure that that you assign the correct uh, media basically uh, and as long as that's uh, correct, and you uh, include everything you need in uh, the field of view. Uh, the uh, the output will be uh, correct as well. Um, to add on that for the open field, it's not something that we usually calibrate mm -hmm. or measure, um, but we could do that. Like you would, um, yeah. Basically, you would just uh, treat the open field as any other collimator and make sure to uh, characterize it. Um, and then you could use it. Um, but we haven't done that so far. It's like usually what uh, researchers want, want to use uh, are the fit and like the, uh, the standard uh, the set of beams that, that that come with uh, with the machine. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess this is a follow-up question regarding the in vivo radiation. Um, regarding the collimator size, and uh, just a question about the collimators being too small to irradiate a well plate. Is there any comment on that particular concern around the collimator size? Um, uh, a full well plate and indeed is uh, probably uh, too big. So then you pr probably have to uh, have to move to the open field. Um, to be honest, it's not something that, uh, of course, the machine is uh, specifically uh, meant to be used for. It's more for uh, autotopic uh, treatments uh, and so on. But of course, I do understand that when uh, the researchers have the machine that they also want to do uh, the petri dish work maybe with it so um yeah i don't see yeah, maybe, issue with that. Yeah, yeah maybe it's also a good segue to the other product we're um pr producing for the uh, the cabinet uh, machines uh, also in collaboration with extral uh that we have a more simple software that's intended for the for for large field irradiation um the the thinking was to uh yeah dedicate this software to the the cabinet style radiators, but perhaps we should also reconsider if uh, many people are using uh, the extra um, 
radiator uh, for uh, yeah uh, these sort of large scale uh, in, vivo, in vitro and uh, cell irradiations. Okay. Um, next question: Do you need a micro CT for planning images, or is it, or is the X-ray device on the radiation system sufficient? Yeah, I I think the uh, uh, the micro C CT that's uh, uh, or or, or like a regular uh, CT image uh, guidance that's on uh, on board. I think it's uh, sufficient for these. Uh, applications um, you can go down to about a resolution uh, from the top of my head I might be a little bit off but it's around like 0 0.1 millimeter resolution um, which from my experience is uh, more than sufficient for uh, any uh, application for the SARP um, also a micro CT um, as long as like it's either um, acquired in the same frame of reference, or you can um, register uh, uh, the micro CT image to to the uh, regular CT image, then then you could uh, uh, then you could use both um, for uh, planning purposes actually. So it could uh, help you with uh, planning, so uh, targeting basically. But I would say, from what I've seen, a regular CT is, is, is more than uh, sufficient. Okay. Um, are there any reference with independent verifications of the system? Any references? I'm not sure exactly the nature of this question, or, but I guess it's around independent verification. We have our uh, we have an article in the Green Journal uh, that was with the platform we developed, PXI. Um, uh, we don't have uh, a secondary one uh, follow up. Uh, um, Frank, uh, is there anything else you can think of that uh, we could correct? Uh... Yeah, we we have that one paper in the Green Journal, but uh, <clears throat> we did of course do extensive validation on the on the SAR platform as well. So it's uh, currently it's still unpublished, but uh, yeah, we of course have validated it. Okay. A next question: uh, How how does the segmentation of the CT image impact the accuracy of the dose calculation? Does Smart XPS require the Hunsfeld unit calibration, or does gray value suffice? Um, yeah, to be, to be honest, we were a bit caught off actually by the, the uh, uh, that. Uh, users make use of gray value. So um, uh, we are somewhat, we're trying trying to standardize that now. Um, but I don't know if, if we've, uh, um, in general, I don't think it'd be a problem, uh, but uh, we would like to certainly ensure that uh, from one user to the other, um, that uh, we have consistent, uh, um, um, yeah, we incorporate it in at least in a consistent manner. Um, Stefan, did you get any farther there uh, with that? Or um, yeah, it's it, it's a it's a topic that that we're uh, currently also still uh, uh, improving. Um, the goal is definitely to do um, specific uh, CT to density calibrations. In the end, so that we can uh, re really like uh, calibrate uh, uh, different imaging protocols and uh, particularly uh, um, imaging KVs. Um, at the moment, it's not the case for XPS yet, and it still uh, assigns the same density uh, per medium. Uh, but the end goal is definitely to do uh, to to improve that so that you can really uh, calibrate each uh, imaging protocol you have. Uh, yeah, it, it, comes we'll to, yeah. It, may, it may be that we have to add in the commissioning procedure a scan of our own little micro phantom. I have, I have it here actually, uh, if you can see <clears> in my window, uh, where we know the densities uh, very well. 
And um, yeah, we come up essentially with a, a curve which we generate through the commissioning procedure. Um, um, that, that could be the, uh, the situation. Okay, uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, next, next one, are DICOM files compatible to be read by gamma analysis systems used for clinical work, um, Verisoft for instance? It's definitely uh, compatible with uh, the DICOM standard uh, as far as we can do. Uh, I'm not familiar with specific uh, gamma analysis software. Um, but on the import side, um, we of course import the uh, DICOM CT that comes from uh, the SARP into our uh, software. Uh, and further on, you can also import DICOM RTstruct, RTPET, uh mr um and on the export side uh you can export your uh, plan as rt dose including the rt dvh and also the rt struct uh, any uh, structures that you created as rt struct um so with that i think you have the full package to take your data to other uh, software and if that would be gamma analysis software, then I think you have all, all the all the files you need. Yeah, we won't have it. Uh, bottom line, there won't be a problem doing gamma, gamma analysis. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. There are several questions. I'll kind of all group together, um, and and I can take this final one. So there there are a few questions around Miri Plan, Miri Plan um, versus Smart XPS. There are a couple of questions around um, different you know pricing. Um, obsolescence and support from Glow, et cetera. So, um, so just to address the question around smart XPS and, and Miri plan, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, you know, we, we are committed to supporting all of our clients and using the treatment planning system of their choice. So um, it is certainly not Xtral's expectation that, you know, Miri plan will, will go away and, and smart XPS will become the um, the replacement of the system. You know, we want to support all of our clients in choosing the, the system that's best for them. Um, we will be following up with everyone who registered uh, for this event with some more information, detailed information about Smart XPS, as well as um, if you if you address a specific question around sort of feature comparisons, uh, pricing, sales sales questions, we'll make sure to have someone follow up with you directly um, or a product specialist if it's it's more um, suitable to that individual. Uh, so on behalf of the um, entire Extral team as well as our, our partners from Smart Scientific Solutions, we want to thank you for your attention today. As I mentioned at the beginning, we're, we're very excited about this collaboration. Um, as Dr. Granton mentioned, um, we're also looking at work, ongoing work to support Smart XPS for our cabinet portfolio as well, um, as well as additional collaborations in the future. So thank you for your attention, and we will follow up with you after the event with the recording and additional information about um, Smart XPS. Thanks so much uh, for your time, and we appreciate your attention. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.